Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Agile India uh, 2014. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the opening keynote. I thought it was uh, uh, quite illuminating. Uh, I uh, learned a couple of things from it, especially the social message at the end. So today we're talking about from lean startup to agile enterprise. So taking agile outside of the traditional domains of IT and taking those concepts from the lean movement and the agile movement across the entire organization. So let's start with a question. Chrysler, Kodak, General Foods, Compaq, Digital. What do all these organizations have in common? That's not a rhetorical question. I actually want an answer. They're either they've gone bankrupt, they've failed, they've been forcibly acquired by another organization. Okay? All because they couldn't adapt. All because as an organization, their business model was stuck in the past, and when the world moved on, they didn't move with the world. Kodak is the great example. They developed digital photography. Okay? But what did they do with it? They thought it wouldn't actually become uh, a viable product stream for another 20 years, when instead we all have digital cameras in our mobile phones. So let's look at something. A short video, this is only a couple of minutes long, or only a minute long. This is the rise and the fall of the Fortune 100 companies, well actually technically the Fortune 50. Uh, 1985, 1995, here we have Chrysler, 2005, we have a couple of companies coming back. These are American companies, by the way, so you may not recognize all the names. Now, let's look at 2013's top 50 companies and compare that against 1985. 27 of the top 50 companies, oops, sorry, 27 of the top 50 companies no longer exist in the form that they did at the time. They have either shrunk to a smaller market share to what they started with, or they have been forcibly acquired, or they have gone bankrupt. So who am I? My name is Evan Laybourne. I've flown in from Melbourne, Australia. I work with organizations around the world on adaptive businesses, making an organization, making a business uh, agile, okay? lean and agile. Everything from the human resources to finance, sales and marketing, and of course, our IT. Let's do a little bit of a Q&A here. Hands up if you're a software developer. Okay, about half of you. All right, so for those of you who are developers or in the IT space, everything that we talk about today applies to you. In fact, you should know it, okay? Because you're at an Agile conference, you understand the concepts. But what I want you to learn and what I want you to take away from this talk is that you can go much beyond test-driven development, much beyond Scrum and product delivery. And we can apply those into every facet of an organization. So, we live in interesting times. Our economy is changing. The rise of mobile technologies, the rise of big data, the rise of the cultural changes which are coming through the next series of generations and their expectations of how business operates means that business needs to do something better. It needs to work in a better manner. So, let's just start. If I use the words, Individuals and interactions, what do you say? Over. Thank you. And if I use uh, working software, over comprehensive documentation. Now, excuse me. I was going to take. Now, if we're talking the Agile Manifesto, we need to make a few changes. It's no longer working software. Working software is great if you're building software, but what if you're in human resources and you're doing a recruitment drive? 
What if you're in sales and marketing and you're trying to get a new client? So we changed the business rules away from working software to working products and services, completed customer requirements, or if you use Martin's concept, completed intents. So what we want to do is we want to have a complete business transformation. And this business transformation will be derived differently depending on the organization. Right? Your organizational culture, your organizational strengths and weaknesses, your organizational demands from your customers and your clients, regulatory environment that you work in, will all drive how you create an agile organization. Right? In some cases, it's going to be straightforward. Many of you, in fact, probably most of you work for an IT organization um, or a large IT department within your organization. You've already adopted Agile internally. That's why you're here. But we can go beyond that, and we can take the organizational culture across the organization, not just in the minute part, which is IT, or the, ma the major part, which is IT. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea about cultural change. Now, some of you may have seen this because I have shamelessly stolen it from IC Agile and Ahmed Sitsky. This shows the change of an organization. Now, this is true whether you're changing IT or whether you're changing the board of directors. You can't just make one change. You can't just address processes. If you put Scrum in an organization, whether it be IT or finance, okay, it will fail. Your organization is bounded by your organizational culture, and it acts as a constraint. It acts as a, an elastic band, okay, or a hair band, that constrains your organization to a certain shape. Right? If you push, if you put Scrum in there, and you keep pushing Scrum in, while you're holding Scrum, while you're working it, okay, you're going to be pushing at that organizational culture. But the minute you stop pushing, it's going to snap back people are going to fall back to their traditional activities. So we need to address change, not at a single level, but at the organizational level, across the entire spectrum, from leadership, people, processes, tools. So change occurs at all levels of an organization, whether you're changing IT, whether you're changing finance, or whether you're changing everything. So, let me tell you a story. So, like all good stories, this starts once upon a time in a land about 10,000 kilometers away. Okay. This organization had a problem, okay? And that problem was it was successful. Now, this sounds like a good problem to have, but a, being a very thoughtful and forethought organization, they saw this problem as success now does not equal success in the future. They need to be able to adapt. They know that their customers are fickle. They'll create a product, and they may sell 100 million copies of that product in the first year, but in the second year, they may sell 10. So they need to be able to adapt to changing market environments, an adaptable business. So what did they do? They looked internally, and they went, do we have an adaptable business function, a business function that works for us? And the answer was yes, IT. Okay? Because IT had taken on Agile, specifically a combination of Scrum and Kanban, Scrum Ban, as some of you may call it. And what they had done is they had produced a product, they had worked with their customers, they had adapted to their customers' needs. And so this organization, it was, it was a financial services organization to be specific, this organization took that idea and said, you know what, we can apply this wider. And so they started with their human resources area. Okay? They made that adaptable. They wanted to recruit people who were uh, adaptable. They wanted to grow the business. And what I'm going to talk to you about is their journey. Okay? The steps that they took to become an agile organization. You can follow a similar path. Once again, your journey will be different depending on your strengths and weaknesses. But this was their journey, the journey that they took. The first thing was we defined a vision, okay? a business goals. Where are we going in 12 months, in 24, in five years' time? What do we want the organization to look like? And you'll do the same whether you're transforming an IT, organization, or IT department or an entire organization. Now, 
A vision is nothing without metrics. We need to actually prove we got there. We need to prove that we're on our way. Okay? Now, if we take lean startup principles, all right, this vision has to be quantifiable. It has to be something that we can accurately measure. Right? But it has to be a realistic measure. Similarly, if our vision is wrong, we need to be able to pivot, change. Okay? Our vision for the company in five years' time, based on our current understanding of the market, may change. Maybe we write mobile apps today, but tomorrow mobile apps are passe. Everyone's doing them. So we're going to find a new strategy, a new corporate path that will make our, organizational, our organization adaptable to whatever changes the business brings. I tend to recommend organizations have, rather than one portfolio, rather than a strategic direction, have four or five strategic directions. Have them complementary or contradictory in many cases. Pick the ones at the certain times which work for your organization. And if they don't work, drop it. Right. Strategy is not about following a plan. Okay? No general has a plan, a strategic plan for a battle, and then goes into battle, and that's what they do. A strategy is a goal, and they'll have multiple strategies depending on the terrain, on the uh, weather. Okay? They'll have different ways of working in different circumstances. We're exactly the same. Right. The next thing we need to do is we need to communicate this to everyone. An agile organization, what do we value? Okay. Individuals. Individuals and interactions. Okay. So this isn't a journey that the executive take alone. This isn't a journey that the IT department takes alone. This is a journey that the entire organization needs to be aligned to. If they do not align, if they do not understand the journey, then they won't come with you. At worst, they'll actually work actively against you. Okay? Now, this is actually not necessarily a bad thing. And I'm going to be a little bit controversial and say, there are going to, if your organization is going down the agile path, if you're building an agile organization or just an agile IT department, then if there are people who won't come along for the ride, maybe it's better for them to be in a different organization. Maybe they're not the right people for your company. Okay. And we do talk about redundancies in any sort of organizational transformation. This is not a dirty word. This is something that you work with them about. It shouldn't be a surprise. Okay. If you're going towards an agile approach, then they should know 12, 24 months in advance how things are going. And if they can't operate in that environment, it should be obvious to them, as well as to the executives of the organization, whether or not this is working. Alongside that, we have to have an agile recruitment policy. We want to hire people who have the right cultural fit. We want to hire people who can adapt. There is a place in organizations for drones, people who do the work that they are told and who have no initiative of their own. Okay? That's not necessarily a bad thing. But in an agile organization, we talk about teams. We talk about empowered teams. If an individual can't take on the authority and accountability that empowerment requires, then why are they there? Pivot. At this point in our process, we're probably six to 12 months into our transformation. Right? And in the case of the, organiza uh, the organization I'm, in, I'm using as a case study, right, they were 12 months in. Okay? So we use retrospectives. Everyone here knows what a retrospective is? Scrum? Yes? Don't need to explain it. Wonderful. So we use the concept of retrospectives to drive organizational change. Each individual is empowered to recommend improvements. Maybe if we try this, maybe if we try a different way of working. Let's introduce estimation. No, actually, estimation didn't work for us. We're going to go no estimates. It doesn't matter what the actual outcomes of the retrospectives are. As long as you have them and the right people are taking ownership, actions are coming out of those retrospectives, and the organization can change. I put the word pivot in here. Okay? In, in a lean startup concept, pivot is literally 
we have identified a customer need. It is different to what it was yesterday, and we're going to change the organization 180 degrees to address this new organizational strategy, this new customer suite of requirements. Right? The retrospectives are how you pivot. They give you that mechanism, that way in which the organization adapts. This is one of the most important uh, processes or concepts to have come out of Scrum. Oh, in fact, come out of Agile because it actually predates Scrum as well. Another organization I'd like to talk about briefly, the New Zealand Post Group. Okay. New Zealand Post Group is uh, literally the postal service in the country of New Zealand. Just if you don't know where that is, it's just to the left of Australia, or right? Well, right of Australia. Um, this organization is big. It contains a bank. Okay? It is a group of companies, only one of which is the Postal Service. Okay? So we're talking very large revenues in the billions of dollars. So New Zealand Postal Group, they, have, they use Agile for their um, executive teams. They have a strategy Kanban board, which I'll show you in a minute. But this I want to talk about. This was one of the greatest ideas that I ever saw. Right? New Zealand Post Group put together they have their Kanban room. They call it a sorting room because they're, they're a post group, so they have to have some postal metaphors in there. Okay? But this, they have one wall, or in our case, it's actually a door, okay? which has an elephant on it. So who here knows the term elephant in the room? Yeah, most of you. An elephant in the room is something that everyone knows is there, but nobody's actually willing to talk about. Right? And let's face it, if you do have a literal element to elephant in the room, you're going to have problems. Okay, you need to get it out of the room. So this is a door. Anyone can put a little post-it note on it, and it forces that to be discussed. It forces that topic, whatever it is. Okay? I think our estimation mechanisms are uh, quite bad. You don't even have to put your name on it. Okay? It can be an anonymous feedback, but it forces that conversation to occur. Here's where things start to get tricky. We have two concepts in the lean and the agile world. Okay? Continuous delivery and incremental delivery. Now, what I'm about to say is highly simplistic and wrong, okay? but it is a good rule of thumb. Okay? Processes, like, um, sorry. Processes like Scrum, okay? XP, promote an incremental delivery, iterations, sprints, whatever you want to call them. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks of work, time boxed and encapsulated. Right. Finance, marketing, legal, R&D, these are all business processes that work well with increments of work. Okay. Your legal department can plan what they're going to do two weeks in advance. In many cases, in some cases they can't. I'm talking generally here. Okay. Your finance team, when they're building a budget, they're building that months in advance. Okay. Marketing. Okay. Your marketing department are going to put together marketing strategies. In fact, I have a case study um, uh, which I'm working on at the, on at the moment, which is a an marketing team that uses Scrum to, to promote their marketing campaigns. And they use a very lean startup approach. If a marketing campaign cannot provably make an impact within the uh, four weeks of their iteration, then they will drop that campaign and try a different one. Continuous delivery is the domain, once again, this is highly simplistic, but the domain of lean and Kanban. Okay? It's not about grouping work into iterations. It's not about two weeks of work. Human resources, sales, customer support, media and communications are all reactive. Okay? Um, or their requirements come in so quickly that they can't actually group them into an iteration. So we use a different style of an approach. We use a continuous approach, continuous delivery. We all heard the talk about continuous delivery. Continuous delivery works outside of IT. If you're human resources and you're doing a round of recruitment, you have to recruit 20 new software developers. Okay? It doesn't matter whether you recruit them all in one hit or whether you recruit one, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth, all the way up to number 20 because you're continuously delivering or deploying 
uh, new resource as soon as they become available, as soon as they finish that recruitment process. But this doesn't work if we don't actually track it, if we don't actually put in place the mechanisms to validate that what we're doing is correct. Okay? Now, we talk about Kanban. Okay? Sorry. We talk about Kanban as a mechanism for uh, visualizing flow. Kanban, there's nothing uniquely software about Kanban. It didn't come out of software. It came out of manufacturing. So the same rules, as long as you can visualize a consistent work process, as long as you can create a value stream map of a process, human resources, sales and marketing, it doesn't matter. As long as you have that value stream map, as long as you understand your WIP limits, then you can put together a Kanban board to visualize the flow of that work. We also have our restructure. No agile approach, no agile organization, can be strictly hierarchical, okay? Now, I'm gonna come across some uh, tension talking to an Asian audience uh, about breaking down hierarchy, all right? I work with a lot of organizations in Singapore and Malaysia and Philippines and India, and one of the most common issues I come across with an agile business model is, well, I'm a senior software engineer, what do I tell my wife if I'm now just a team member, if I'm just one person amongst many. So it can, this is one of the hardest parts of breaking down those cultural barriers. But what we actually want is a lean, efficient communication matrix. And I'll explain about that in a minute. Okay. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay. Um, this is off maligned, it's not necessarily accurate, but it is a model of human motivation. Okay. At the bottom, we have pure psychological, sorry, physiological motivations. Food, water, shelter. Okay. This is where your minimum wage employment comes in. Okay. If I'm a, 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 a chai waller, if I'm just there serving tea, then all I'm getting out of my job is food, shelter, the basic physiological needs. But we're intelligent. Okay. We go into software programming, we go into development, we go into business because we have drives, we have motivations, we are interested, we are passionate about the work that we do. The more passion that can actually be applied to your work, this level of self-actualization, then we have our agile business management or our, or our agile approach to work. I want you to be empowered. I want you to come to work, not just because you get a paycheck, but because you love it. And this is the difference between traditional employment and agile employment or an agile business. We, of course, have to have coaching. Okay? We want our organization to understand. The critical thing here is this, customers. We all know the value of training and coaching for staff, managers, and so forth. We've been doing it for years. But your customers need to understand what it means to be agile. And that's the hardest part. If they don't want to be agile, then you're not going to be. This is one of the things that I particularly love about agile. We have our own nomenclature. We have our own language. Our language is not the language of business. Nobody cares what a sprint is. Okay? Nobody cares what a scrum of scrums is. Nobody cares what, a, uh, what pair programming is. We need to translate this into language that business understands. Iterations rather than sprints. Okay? Not daily scrums, daily stand-ups. Tell it what it is. Okay? It's no longer test, uh, pair programming or test-driven development because those are software specific. It's now test-driven work, okay? pair work. It doesn't matter what the work is. Okay? It doesn't have to be software. So we now enter the second year of our transformation. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. Yep. We're now entering our second year of our transformation. Here we start to transform not just the simple things, but the organization. Okay? We have an agile executive. We have an agile board now. Okay? Our board of directors can be agile. Okay? Boards of directors are responsible for the governance of an organization. Okay? 
if they can't adapt to changing market circumstances and approve the pivoting of an organization to address new issues, then the organization can't be truly agile from the very top to the very bottom, okay? From the basic janitor who needs to decide which room to spend the most time cleaning, that's an agile decision, right? To the board of directors who needs to decide whether or not they're going to address uh, uh, mobile development or big data. Honestly, it doesn't matter as long as they can make those decisions. This here is the executive Kanban board from New Zealand Post Group. Okay? This is a wall, an entire room. Anybody can walk into this room in the organization and see the corporate strategies and the work towards each step okay, as they go. This is brilliant. This is one of the greatest ideas because this just not shows this is the portfolio of work that they're working on. But more than that, it shows that where they are, the dynamicness, dy the dynamics of their portfolio. And if something turns out to be not worth it, that can change. Okay? We have our agile key performance indicators. Okay? KPIs are important because we need to measure. If you want to be brave enough, okay, here's my favorite KPI for an agile organization, failure. If your senior executives can't prove that they have failed, can't prove that they have managed failure, then should they get their bonus? I don't think so. Because unless they can prove they have learned, unless they have proved that they have identified something that is performing poorly and improved it, then they've not made any substantial benefit to the organization. Failure is a positive KPI. That's my recommendation to you. Okay. We talk about agile financial management. There are ways in which we can encapsulate budgets in an agile way, monthly budgets rather than yearly budgets, team contingency, and of course, okay, an understanding of flow. A budget is effectively a pipe. Right? If you want to add more work, work into that pipe, one of three things are going to happen. Either something falls out the end, okay, as in you don't finish something, you extend the length of the pipe, you add time, or you increase the size, you add resources. This is how you have to visualize your budget in an agile context. You can't get more work for the same money. We now continue our organizational restructure. We, we, we have cross-functional teams. We now start to move towards facilitation-based management. Our managers, our business leaders are no longer authoritative. It's no longer, you will do this because I tell you. It's, tell me, what's the best way that we can deliver, deliver this product? All right, that's a great idea. I'll give you two weeks. If there's any issues, I will try and get it out of the way. Come to me if you can't deliver. Okay? It's a change in the way that we lead. And this is true whether you're leading an IT team or whether you're leading an entire organization. Communication is key. By breaking our teams into uh, uh, teams of uh, seven plus or minus two, okay, we stop having our communication overhead is reduced. The more, the larger a team is, okay, the more, the greater the overhead of communication. So what we want is to have this flow. If our team is massive, let's break it into smaller teams. So our organizational restructure becomes nodal. It becomes a cell structure. Individual, self-contained, empowered, self-organizing teams. Okay? Our customers need to be agile. Okay? We talk about the level of trust. Reference trust, my customer comes to me because they're recommended. Contract trust, I trust my customer because I have a contract saying if they don't do the work, then there are penalties and liabilities attached to it. That's not agile. We want an agile customer. We've got to be up here. Our customers need to partner with us. Our customers need to be part of our work processes rather than just the end output. If it's an agile question, it, your customer needs to understand these three questions. How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? And what am I going to get? If this isn't the answer to your customer, and if they don't accept that answer, then they're not agile. You need to work with them to understand what the outcomes of those are. If they're a partner, they'll understand. If you just have a contract with them, 
those answers are not going to be sufficient. We talk about pivots once again. We're here at the end of the second year. We're trying to change. We've already changed our organization quite significantly, but the market is also changing with us. If our market doesn't adapt, sorry, if, our market, if we don't change to our market, if we don't pivot the organization, then everything we've done is in vain. Okay? We talk about, once again, continuous improvement. We continue to visualize and track our workflow. We introduce burn down charts. We introduce cumulative flow diagrams, statistical run charts. All of these are agile tools that we use to visualize process and progress. It doesn't matter whether it's software. The same tools apply, whether you're talking human resources, whether you're talking sales and marketing, or whether you're talking the board of directors. All right? Stage three, we're entering our third or fourth year. Uh, in the example I'm using, in the, in the transformation I'm talking, this was year four. Okay? We finalize the organizational restructure. All right? Our teams are dynamic. They are small. They form and reform depending on the business needs. Okay? We, we're no longer a matrix organization. We no longer have silos. Okay? There are still business functions. There's still a team or several teams that are responsible for finance, several teams that are responsible for marketing and communications. Okay? So these teams still have core functionality, but the team members may change. The finance team may have four accountants, but they may bring in a graphic designer or a technical writer as needed to try and develop this um, specific requirements to the customer. Okay? Our organization is purely dynamic. Okay? Managers are responsible not to lead, sorry, not to manage, but to lead, to facilitate. Okay? Our organization transforms from a traditional structure down to a much more agile structure. Business functions, we have coaches and we have some managers. Okay? Much simpler. This is the city of Edmonton. Okay? Or specifically the IT department within the city of Edmonton. They went through an agile business transformation. Okay? They no longer have traditional business functions. Okay? They have people who are responsible for certain functions. Then they have teams that form and reform as needed. Then they have a number of coaches to help facilitate the process. Okay? To make this work, larger organizations are going to have a skills audit. They're going to have a skills register. Okay? If there's 10,000 people in your organization and you need a technical writer, you don't know who to bring in. So there would be a register that you could look at. Okay? We can bring in many of the agile processes. Test-driven work, okay? pair work. These are processes that works regardless of whether we're talking about software or not. Yes, automation is hard when we're not talking software. It's hard to automate human resource recruitment. It's hard to automate the annual budget. There are certainly some things we can automate, and where possible we should, like that's a good practice. But we can still define our test cases, our acceptance criteria before we start. Okay? We can still pair and have one observer and one driver. Okay? We still have our retrospectives. I keep harping on about the retrospectives, because the retrospectives, this is our mechanism. This is how we drive change. All right. So this brings us to the end. Okay. You spent the last 40 minutes listening to me talk about how to build an agile organization. I have to say, there is a community that is coming together, agilebusinessmanagement.org. Okay. There are a number of case studies, articles. Um, it's quite small at the moment. We're, if you are interested, please join us. If you would like to submit case studies, if you'd like to have more ideas, come and talk to us. So on that note, thank you very much for listening to me. Questions? No questions. That all made sense. There we go. I knew there had to be a question financial management. There are ways in which we can encapsulate budgets in an agile way. Monthly budgets rather than yearly budgets. Team contingency. And of course, okay, an understanding of flow. A budget is effectively a pipe. Right? If you want to add more work, work into that pipe, one of three things are going to happen. Either something falls out the end, okay, as in you don't finish something, you extend the length of the pipe, you add time, or you increase the size, you add resources. This is how you have to visualize 
your budget in an agile context. You can't get more work for the same money. We now continue our organizational restructure. We, we, we have cross-functional teams. We now start to move towards facilitation-based management. Our managers, our business leaders are no longer authoritative. It's no longer, you will do this because I tell you. It's, tell me, what's the best way that we can deliver, deliver this product? All right, that's a great idea. I'll give you two weeks. If there's any issues, I will try and get it out of the way. Come to me if you can't deliver. Okay, is a change in the way that we lead. And this is true whether you're leading an IT team or whether you're leading an entire organization. Communication is key. By breaking our teams into uh, uh, teams of uh, seven plus or minus two, okay, we stop having our communication overhead is reduced. The more the larger a team is, okay, the more the greater the overhead of communication. So what we want is to have this flow. If our team is massive, let's break it into smaller teams. So our organizational restructure becomes nodal. It becomes a cell structure. Individual, self-contained, empowered, self-organizing teams. Okay? Our customers need to be agile. Okay? We talk about the level of trust. Reference trust. My customer comes to me because they're recommended. Contract trust. I trust my customer because I have a contract saying if they don't do the work, then there are penalties and liabilities attached to it. That's not agile. We want an agile customer. We've got to be up here. Our customers need to partner with us. Our customers need to be part of our work processes rather than just the end output. Okay? If it's an agile question, it, your customer needs to understand these three questions. How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? And what am I going to get? If this isn't the answer, to your customer, and if they don't accept that answer, then they're not agile. You need to work with them to understand what the outcomes of those are. If they're a partner, they'll understand. If you just have a contract with them, those answers are not going to be sufficient. We talk about pivots once again. We're here at the end of the second year. We're trying to change. We've already changed our organization quite significantly, but the market is also changing with us. If our market doesn't adapt, Sorry, if, our market, if we don't change to our market, if we don't pivot the organization, then everything we've done is in vain. Okay? We talk about, once again, continuous improvement. We continue to visualize and track our workflow. We introduce burn down charts. We introduce cumulative flow diagrams, statistical run charts. All of these are agile tools that we use to visualize process and progress. It doesn't matter whether it's software, the same tools apply whether you're talking human resources, whether you're talking sales and marketing, or whether you're talking the board of directors. All right. Stage three, we're entering our third or fourth year. Uh, in the example I'm using, in the, in the transformation I'm talking, this was year four. Okay. We finalize the organizational restructure. All right. Our teams are dynamic. They are small. They form and reform depending on the business needs. Okay? We, we're no longer a matrix organization. We no longer have silos. Okay? There are still business functions. There's still a team or several teams that are responsible for finance, several teams that are responsible for marketing and communications. Okay? So these teams still have core functionality, but the team members may change. The finance team may have four accountants, but they may bring in a graphic designer or a technical writer as needed to try and develop this um, specific requirements to the customer. Okay? Our organization is purely dynamic. Okay? Managers are responsible not to lead, sorry, not to manage, but to lead, to facilitate. Okay? Our organization transforms from a traditional structure down to a much more agile structure. Business functions, we have coaches and we have some managers. Okay? Much simpler. This is the city of Edmonton, okay? or specifically the IT department within the city of Edmonton. They went through an agile business transformation. Okay? They no longer have traditional business functions. Okay? They have people who are responsible for certain functions. Then they have teams that form and reform as needed. Then they have a number of coaches to help facilitate the process. Okay? To make this work, larger organizations are going to have a skills audit. They're going to have a skills register. 
Okay? If there's 10,000 people in your organization and you need a technical writer, you don't know who to bring in. So there would be a register that you could look at. Okay? We can bring in many of the agile processes. Test-driven work, okay? pair work. These are processes that works regardless of whether we're talking about software or not. Yes, automation is hard when we're not talking software. Okay? It's hard to automate human resource recruitment. It's hard to automate the annual budget. There are certainly some things we can automate, and where possible we should, like that's a good practice. But we can still define our test cases, our acceptance criteria before we start. Okay? We can still pair and have one observer and one driver. Okay? We still have our retrospectives. I keep harping on about the retrospectives because the retrospectives, this is our mechanism. This is how we drive change. So this brings us to the end. Okay? You spent the last 40 minutes listening to me talk about how to build an agile organization. I have to say there is a community that is coming together, agilebusinessmanagement.org. Okay? There are a number of case studies, articles. Um, it's quite small at the moment. We, if you are interested, please join us. If you would like to submit case studies, if you'd like to have more ideas, come and talk to us. So, on that note, thank you very much for listening to me. Questions? No questions. That all made sense. There we go. I knew there had to be a question. You spoke about uh, marketing becoming agile. Uh, the question that I have is, agile is an experiment or a successful experiment in deploying new things, in releasing new functionalities, in releasing new features. But most businesses also have a day job, which is to collect money, collect revenue. Yeah, sorry, okay. So how do you break this jinx of improving your current work and doing something new? Because most. Most developers have a day job to write code, and they can do that using Agile. It's, Agile is not just an experiment. It's not something that one team tries, and then if it works, great. It's the entire software development lifecycle adjusts to how do we become adaptive. Okay? I talk about a transformation, and yes, a transformation is a program of work above and beyond okay, your, your, your day job. But the point of a transformation, we talk about the vision, the very first slide, in this transformation was vision. That vision is our end state. Where are we trying to get to? When we've hit that end state, it actually doesn't matter. Okay? Once we've hit that end state, we're no longer transforming because we've transformed. Okay? We still have the retrospectives because we still want to adapt. But the major transformation is now over. So yes, a transformation has the cost. It always has a cost, whether you're transforming to agile or whether you're transforming to a matrix structure. Okay, it doesn't matter. There's always a cost. But yes, the whole point is to improve the day job. Another question? Hi, like, you know, I have a small startup and I work with a, a bunch of people who have just come out of college, uh, people who don't have much of an experience. And I also Do they have, have passion? They do. I mean, then, <laughs> good. <laughs> as long as they have passion. <laughs> passion over experience any day. Uh, Sorry, continue. Yeah. And uh, we are a services company, and uh, we have a marketing person who is not, you know, related to IT at yep. all. And uh, my concern is like, you know, at this point of time when my team is really working on, uh, you know, four or five different things, how do I bring in uh, agility in them? Okay. So working on five, four or five different things is 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 exactly what agile is about. It's about identifying, like, trying different ways of of. of releasing a product, whether it's software. Your marketing person needs to be embedded with your software team. Like, you have a startup, which means your employees are, what, 10? Something around that? Yeah, seven employees. So you have a very small team. They should be working not 
independently but together. Every time your startup, every time your developers release a new feature, release a new function, and we talk about lean startup, we talk about uh, being able to pivot, being able to release a minimum viable product. The minute that minimum viable product is ready, the marketing person needs to have a strategy of how they're going to market it, how they're going to build that brand. Right? And then when the next comes up, the marketing person needs to be ready. So they have to be together. Okay? This is why I talk about cross-functional teams. You don't just have a marketing person over here and a software development team over here. You have one team, seven people. Seven plus or minus two is your team size. Everybody in that team should be working together for the common outcome. Okay? And, and in your case, it is getting a minimal viable product to market and having a marketing strategy to promote it. Hi, hey, my question is, uh, you just mentioned that, you know, we have to transfer the organizations, so various support functions like finance and, so uh, think about a giant organization which is having a 50 years of history and is successfully running, and they do have to implement Agile, they have adopted one part of it, but the other part of the, sub the other support function is working just fine. So what if I throw up a question as to if I'm working fine, why should I change? Uh, very, very good question, and the one that's usually asked to me. Okay? okay, if everything's working fine, why should I change? Now, my argument to that is because it's working fine is when you should change. It's working fine today. Okay? Tomorrow, something may happen. The market may change, and things are no longer working fine. And if you're not ready for that change, your business can collapse. I talk about those Fortune 100 companies at the beginning. They were going fine. Kodak had hun oh, like, like about, was it hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. Okay? And now they're like one of the smallest companies. They've been bought and sold a number of times. They're no longer a going concern in by many measures. Okay? So when things are going fine is when you need to prepare for when things won't be fine. If you assume that things are always going to be fine, okay, then you will go the same way as Chrysler, as Kodak. So that is when you have to change. I'll leave it there. I'll have take, if you have other questions, please come and see me. I'm the one in the three-piece suit. I should be fairly easier to find. I have a book. I have to, uh, obligatory, I have to mention it. There's a book signing tonight. Um, if you uh, have, there are copies of my books in the conference bookstore. Feel free to pick one up. It's at a significant discount for, the, for this course. Sales hat off. If you do have any questions, okay, beyond that, okay, that's my email address. That's my Twitter handle. I'm relatively active on Twitter. Um, or come and see me during one of the breaks. Thank you very much.